I think one of the real challenges has always been um, sort of firstly giving people an idea that what they think of as being boring and everyday and just that job I did for 50 years actually was probably quite important in the big scheme of things is something that other people are actually interested in has had lots of consequences that people might actually be interested in so I think overcoming that you know the, the incredulity that I guess some people actually respond with at first has always been I think one of the funner reactions I've had to deal with but it can be quite challenging um, in interviews when you're trying to convince people that little technical nitty-gritty details of their everyday lives 30 or 40 years ago are actually things that people will want to know about. The long life story approach with its emphasis on stuff that happens outside of career with its emphasis on detail technical detail of exactly what happened with its emphasis on the day-to-day -day, has been a surprise um, for many of the scientists. One of the key problems is that, not, not um, surprisingly, s scientists have an idea about what it is significant to talk about, what they think we might be interested in, uh, because the project's called An Oral History of British Science. And so I think some of them have already categorised things in their lives as being relevant, as they sometimes say, and other things as being irrelevant. I remember one saying to me, oh, I used to play the drums, but that's a bit off the beaten track. And what he meant was, that's got nothing to do with my science. And so you had to, in some cases, um, fight a tendency to want to just talk about science and things that they saw as being related to that either before they became a scientist or afterwards. One of the, I guess, favourite reactions I once got from a very senior former scientist when I asked what I thought was a fairly innocuous question, something along the lines of, you know, what's your office like or what sort of people are you working with? You know, one of those little nitty-gritty daily questions was, well, he just sort of sat there and fixed me with this steely glaze and said, how on earth does your mind work to ask a question like that? And I think at that point, you know, the view of the historian as being a different perspective on this process from the view of the scientist is really quite important. You know, we are approaching this with a different set of questions to ones they may necessarily have asked themselves and really sort of trying to show them that, you know, what is everyday boring activity to them is actually really historically interesting to other people. One of the things I guess that some people ask me is how do you cope with all the technical detail that scientists probably want to talk about? Um, scientists are very good at talking about technical details. Sometimes it's difficult to get them to talk about things that aren't technical details. And in those sorts of cases, I guess my role as an interviewer is really to adopt the point of view of the idiot in the room. That hideously complicated technical process you've just told me about. What does it look like? What's its broader significance? Can you give me some context to this? Really, I'm sort of trying to find handles for people to actually understand this. So, for instance, someone might describe to you a very complicated process, and you've got an idea of where that complicated process fits in, and you'll realise that, oh, that complicated process they've just talked about, that requires a machine to actually measure it. What sort of machine are you actually using to measure this? So what does that machine look like? Um, are there, is there anybody around to help you use that machine? You know, lab technicians. And you'll sort of try and expand what they are saying about the science into other areas, uh, more broadly social history areas. And so you're always looking for little ways of just spinning off what they're saying into something else. And I think that it's sort of a conversational process. I realised quite some time ago that no matter how much reading I did about the science they were involved in, I was never actually going to be an expert on it. You know, I can sit there for an hour or two reading about a particularly complicated scientific topic, and it won't actually do me that much good in the interview at all because they always know an awful lot more. So really, I've always sort of tried to understand enough to ask a good question and to understand what might be the broader issues here that I can use to actually get them to expand it into other areas they may not necessarily have thought of. It's a very conversational process. It's interesting, I, I sometimes think that perhaps as historians of science we've always tried to sort of look at science as something that's not special and, and in the process of this put it up on a pedestal ourselves. So encountering people for whom science is just a day job has been a really interesting process. Uh, most history of science books I tend to see, they tend to get written about particular scientific issues and topics. They are a historian's synthesis and analysis of a situation. Um, how you actually sort of deal with that from the point of view of someone who was there, who may never have thought about it from this point of view before, I think is a really interesting process. And it really shows you that there's a lot of different perspectives on history. You know, there is the historian's perspective, which should be you know, independent and unbiased and written years later. And then there's the perspective of the person who was actually there 
sometimes they don't necessarily match up that well, which I've always found is a really interesting process. And I think one of the real joys of this job is really sort of creating, creating resources for future historians to actually understand what it was actually like for people to be there at the time.